Amen. One of the things that um, I want to do too is I got so excited about what I'm about to share uh, that I want us to pause right now. I want us to pray for Judgment House. I did not mention that by name, and some of you came to do that. So let's, let's, let's have a word of prayer. We start this week. We start this week, and we're looking forward to sharing the gospel in this way. So let's, uh, let's pray about that. Father, we do just ask that, uh, that you use us for your glory this week as we present the gospel in a unique way. We thank you for all those who are participating, for all the work that's gone into this. And Lord, we just look forward to what you're going to do. We believe that lives are going to be changed for all of eternity. And uh, we look forward to what you're going to do. We give you the praise for it already. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we just sung a great song. I love that song because it really gets to the core of what it's all about. And, and, it, and it said boldly. Uh, you know, sometimes when we hear a song, we, we're not sure exactly what it's saying. We're not, we're not sure where the focus is. Of the, of the song, even the lyrics, what's the real focus of the song? I, well, that song, we, it's, it's very obvious what, what the point is. Now, I want to ask you a question. When we sing, we believe, why are we able to sing that with confidence? Why are we able to sing or to say, we believe? And, and, and why is it that we are able to say that we believe anything that there is about our faith? There's one reason. There's one reason we're able to know what to believe, and that is because of what God has revealed to us in His Word. The Bible helps us understand what it is that we believe. Now, when we read the Word of God, then His Spirit bears witness to our spirit of what the Word of God is saying. So the Word convicts us, the Holy Spirit convicts us by what the Word is telling us, of our need for Christ as he is revealed in scripture and so then there's something that compels us to admit of our sin and our need for God and that God has provided a relationship uh, with him through Jesus Christ and so uh, the, the wrath of God has been satisfied by Jesus Christ and he took our place so that my sin is forgiven now the gospel message is 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 spelled out very clearly in God's word and everything that we believe about our faith is because of what the Word of God says. Now, here's where the problem is. The problem is that we will say, well, I believe what the Bible says about Jesus Christ and about salvation, but there are a lot of other things that the Bible says. I don't know if that's really true. I don't know if that's relevant. And the problem is that we, we develop a very inconsistent faith and it makes us question what we really believe when we're deciding what is relevant and what is not relevant, what is true and what is not true. Because if you say that I, I can sing and I can say that I believe this because the Bible says it, then we have to say we believe everything the Bible says or we can't believe any of it. Now, I'm going to prove that to you today based on what we understand about Jesus Christ. Now, for those who are guests, we're studying the life of Christ. We, we began months ago with, with his birth, and we're getting close to the end. Jesus has been crucified. He's been raised from the dead. By the way, I want to say thank you to Kevin for filling in for me last week. I had the great privilege of preaching at Calvary Baptist Church in Clearwater, Florida, where my father pastored for 30 years and they uh, invited us there. Uh, my dad celebrated his 80th birthday. All the family was there. They asked me to preach. It was a great experience, and uh, I want to thank Kevin for filling in for me. But today, we find that, that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, which was the passage Kevin used last week, in the opening statement of that chapter, he says that Jesus Christ appeared to individuals, he appeared to the 12 disciples of Christ, the apostles. The Bible says that he appeared to at least 500 at one time. There was a gathering of 500. Jesus appeared to them, and some of those people were still living, Paul said, when he wrote 1 Corinthians. 
He had talked to those who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, he even appeared to me. Now, one of the qualifications of being a disciple of Jesus Christ was being an eyewitness of his resurrection. And so the apostle Paul is an apostle because he was eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. It's one of the qualifications. Well, what, what, what we find is that Jesus is having these appearances, and Luke chapter 24 describes one of the scenes in which Jesus appeared. Now, if you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, we're going to see a, a, a great passage. The context here is that there are two followers of Christ. They're walking on a road to a village called Emmaus. And while they're walking, this stranger all of a sudden appears, and he's walking with them, and he asks them, what are they discussing? And one of them, Cleopas is his name. We don't know anything about him other than he was on the road to Emmaus. He, he looks at this stranger, and he says, are you kidding? Are you the only one in Jerusalem that doesn't know what happened? How our, our leaders, our religious leaders, these are Jewish men, they're saying our leaders handed Jesus Christ over to the Romans who crucified him. And then he was raised from the dead and, and he's appeared and, and uh, all of a sudden it's Jesus who is talking with them. Jesus is the one who's walking along. And as they're having this discussion, notice what the Bible says in verse 25. He said to them, how unwise and slow you are to believe in your hearts all that the prophets have spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Now notice verse 27. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scripture. Now notice what he says in verse 26, that, that, that the Messiah had to suffer. That means that there had to be a payment for sin on the cross. And then he says he was going to enter into his glory. He said that he was going to enter into his glory. Now the question is, was the payment that Jesus made accepted by God? If that was the sacrifice to atone for sin, did God accept that sacrifice? And, and, and the scriptures tell us that, that he did by entering into his glory. God raised him from the dead and he seated him at the right hand of the Father where he intercedes on our behalf right now. So he hadn't entered into that glory yet, but he was going to. We know that he has. And so he has suffered and he has entered into his glory. But now in verse 27, Jesus explains this point from the scriptures Jesus is going to reveal to these men now think of it they're on this road they're not two of the apostles of the they're not two of the 12 they are followers of Christ but now this they don't even know it yet that's Jesus later on they ask this man to have dinner with them because it's late at night and he sits down and he continues to tell them about who he is and then all of a sudden the Bible says their eyes are, are, are opened that is Jesus Christ but he's explaining to them who he is in, in, in the Scripture. Now, I want to go back to Matthew chapter 5 to the Sermon on the Mount. So now if you'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus explains his relationship to the Scriptures. He's going to explain himself to the Scriptures. We're going to find that, that he, he's revealing himself. Luke, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus says, Don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all these things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now what Jesus is going to do is he's going to show them who he is uh, from the scriptures on the road to Emmaus. But in, in Matthew chapter 5, he, he's helping them understand who he is as it relates to the scripture. This is important to him about his relationship to the law, to the Word of God. 
First thing I want you to notice is Jesus' belief about the law. Jesus' Bible, we need to understand, was the Old Testament. Jesus did not have the New Testament in written form. But he did have the Old Testament. That means that he had the law, he had history, he had poetry, he had the major and minor prophets that we read in the Old Testament. What you and I read is what Jesus Christ read when he was living on earth. His scriptures were the Hebrew and the Aramaic translations. Now there are two main truths that Jesus believed about the Word of God. Number one, that the Bible was inspired. He refers to himself as the source and the subject of scriptures. In John chapter 5, verse 39, he says, You pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, yet they testify about me. In John 5, 46, For if you believe Moses, you would have believed me because he wrote about me. On the road to Emmaus, what is he saying in Luke 24? The scriptures reveal me. Jesus quoted the scriptures repeatedly because he believed that they were inspired. They were, they were making reference to him. Now, Paul would also affirm the inspiration of scripture, but the topic is Jesus Christ. He, he, when he spoke about the scriptures, he believed that they were inspired by God and that they were inspired to reveal himself. Notice also Jesus believed that the Bible was eternal. In Matthew 5, 17, he says, Do not assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, why would they think that? They, they thought that he was going to come to destroy the law and do away with it. Why would they think that? Well, for several reasons. He had many Sabbath controversies. He would perform miracles on the Sabbath, and uh, they got worked up about that. He, he, they said, you're breaking the law. Or he broke the tradition of the elders. And not just what the law said, but the interpretation of the law that, that, that he didn't do what they said. Or that he cleansed and he reclaimed the temple. He made references to the temple uh, that they did not agree with. And that he was a friend of sinners. They believed you stay away from sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. So they believed that he's going to come and he's going to do away with what the law said. But he came to fulfill the law. As he says, he reaffirms his belief for the eternality of God's word in verse 16. I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. Now, if you have the King James Version, it's going to say one jot or tittle. All right. The jot is the smallest letter. Uh, uh, in Hebrew, which is the yod. It's like an apostrophe, not to go to get into a lot of detail, but that's all that it is. It's a letter. It's the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then he makes reference to a tittle. What is that? It's a brush stroke. In some of the Hebrew letters, if you just add a little stroke at the bottom of the letter, it changes the meaning of the word. And, and just that slight stroke of the brush has significance. And he says, those are significant so much so that everything that that, that apostrophe means, that, that letter, Hebrew letter, that smallest Hebrew letter, and everything that that little brush stroke does to a word has so much significance that it is going to be fulfilled. It will be true uh, for all time, for all time. Isaiah 48 the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the Word of God remains forever. Jesus believed the Scriptures were eternal and not the smallest part of them would be changed until all would be fulfilled. Now this, think of that sentence. What I said earlier. Not one part of God's Word would be changed until all of it was fulfilled. But what disturbs me are the number of alleged Christians who were saying that God's Word doesn't really mean what it says. And that there are changes being made to the meaning and the understanding of God's Word and think that it's okay to do that when God says that, that nothing is going to change concerning my Word until all of it is fulfilled. It remains permanent forever. So that's why we have confidence in what we believe. When you and I say that we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and was raised from the dead, we believe that because of what the Scripture says. It is true. And if we start saying that something else is not true in God's Word, that that doesn't really mean what it says there in God's Word, 
How can you have confidence that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, that he died on the cross and was raised from the dead? You have no confidence if you say that something else in God's word is not true. So Jesus believed that God's word was eternal, that every part of it was eternal. So that why? We can say that we believe in him with confidence. Secondly, notice Jesus' behavior and the law. Jesus says that he came to fulfill the law. Not only was God's eternal word his doctrine, but it was his duty. His life conformed to it. His life exemplified God's word from every standpoint. Now, there are three aspects about that. There are prefigures in the Old Testament as it relates to Jesus Christ. Someone has said the new is in the old contained, while the old is in the new explained. The new is in the old concealed, while the old is in the new revealed. What does that mean? Jesus reveals what the Old Testament conceals about himself. In other words, there are types and shadows of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. It doesn't explicitly say that it's Jesus, but we see a type or a shadow of Christ. Now, we've got to be careful with that, that we're not reading Jesus into everything in the Old Testament, that we're not allegorizing too much of Scripture, although there is some allegory because it says it's allegory in the Bible. But what does it mean when we say that there are types or shadows? Well, if we look at the Exodus, the Red Sea experience, manna from heaven. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Just one example. Rock giving water. Jesus says, I'm the living water. Pillar of a cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. In the tabernacle, each piece of furniture speaks of Jesus Christ. The priesthood represents the priestly work of Jesus Christ. When you look at Adam, there's a first Adam. Paul says there's a second Adam. The first Adam failed. The second Adam did everything perfectly as a man. Much to say about that. Abraham, when he was sacrificing Isaac and God provided a lamb, we see a, a, a foreshadow, a type of Jesus Christ. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, all the rest. As we study those, don't have time to get into them, but but we see Jesus in the Old Testament in these types and shadows. But also in the prophecies. Over 300 prophecies concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a few. And how Jesus fulfills. Notice that, that on the road to Emmaus, he says, The law and the prophets revealed himself. So let's look at that. The Bible says that the Messiah would be a man in Genesis 3.15. I will put hostility, God says, between you to the serpent and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. The Messiah would be a Jew in the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12. The Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49. The place of the Messiah's birth is foretold in Micah 5 verse 2. The Messiah would be born of a virgin in Isaiah 7 verse 14. The suffering of the Messiah was prophesied in Isaiah 53. The death of the Messiah was by crucifixion, which was promised in Psalm 22. I want to read that for you, that passage. Psalm 22, verse 12. Now, I, I, I tell you, if you read this and you can't understand it, then, then you can't. Here's what it says. Many bulls surround me. David's writing. But it's a messianic prophecy. They, the many bulls around, surround me. Strong ones of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me, lions mauling and roaring. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are disjointed. The Bible says that not one bone was broken of Jesus Christ, and that's, we see that in the crucifixion in the Gospels as well. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. What did they do? What, what did Jesus say on the cross? One of the seven statements, I thirst. You put me into the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers have closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves, and they cast lots for my clothing. That's just one prophecy of hundreds of prophecies 
that help us understand Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is prophesied in Psalm 1610. For you will not abandon me to Sheol, you will not allow your faithful one to see the pit. So again, why do we believe in God's word? It reveals to us that this Messiah who was prophesied in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ fulfilled every single prophecy. So if you're here today and you're wondering whether Jesus is who he said he is, you can have confidence today as the Old Testament, the value of God's word has revealed Christ to us, so much so that we believe. Concerning the precepts, Jesus fulfilled the divine precepts as found in the Ten Commandments. He was perfect. Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments revealed God's perfection. They were all fulfilled in Christ. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Now listen, the effectiveness of Jesus' death on the cross depends on his fulfillment of the precepts of the Word of God. You see, if, there's, if, 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 if he sinned one time against the precepts of God's Word, if he sinned in one way, then what he did on the cross is ineffective because then he's a blemished sacrifice he's a sin simple sacrifice so the fact that he didn't sin at any point he became the perfect sacrifice so the fact that he obeyed the precepts of the old testament law qualified him to be the sacrifice on the cross for our sin had he sinned once we wouldn't be here today talking about him we wouldn't be discussing this 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now notice finally, Jesus' burden for the law. He had a threefold burden for the word of God. First of all, that it be practiced. Verse 19, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. He values that the word of God be practiced, that it be obeyed, but also that we're instructing other people to obey the word of God exactly as the word of God is presented. A person is on dangerous ground when they begin to say that, yes, that's what the Bible says, but I believe it's, it means something different. And you're encouraging that person to obey what you believe the word of God says rather than what the word of God says. That's what... That's what uh, Jesus is saying in verse 19. In other words, we need to be practicing the word that we are teaching. What's the, our goal in life? Our goal in life is to live a holy life, a, a life that glorifies God. It doesn't mean I'm going to live a perfect life. It means that my heart's desire is to glorify God with, with my life. So we, we practice it. Secondly, we preach it. Jesus had a burden for the word of God to be preached. Verse 19. But whoever practices and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Our job is simply is to teach the word of God. And I'll help you understand that in just a moment. Our world needs to hear what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, about marriage, about our finances, about our work, about relationships, about what the church is supposed to be about. And that, that, that's why there's so much confusion because we're not in, uh, in the Word of God understanding what it says about all these issues. It's to be preached. But also that Jesus had a burden to perfect it. Verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And what does he mean by that? Our righteousness must be above and beyond the accepted standards of today. There was a family who owned a bakery, and the customer asked a little girl who was helping, do you ever eat one of these cakes? And she said, oh, no, that would be stealing, but I like to lick the icing. And that's the point that Jesus is trying to make, that the Pharisees only scratched the surface of God's law. It was all external. It wasn't what was within. It wasn't the change there. And, and so that's, they were just touching the surface of obedience. 
Jesus' point is the word of God must be perfected in our hearts. Paul says in Romans 10, 10, with the heart one believes, what? Resulting in righteousness. John 17, 17, we heard this a few weeks ago in, John, in Jesus' high priestly prayer. Where Jesus tells his disciples, or prays for his disciples, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So the way that we are set apart and mature in our faith is by the word of God. What does that mean? God's word will transform us. That's the whole point. That the word of God is transforming us. Now I want you to go back to Luke chapter 24 and I want you to notice verse 32. Luke 24, 32. Listen to what Jesus says. Or these two men, Emmaus. They, after Jesus reveals himself, they say this. Weren't our hearts ablaze within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? I cannot tell you how profound that sentence is. I want you to hear it again. Weren't our hearts ablaze within us? Why? While he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us. Let me tell you one of the struggles that we have in our Christian life. Would you be honest, don't raise your hand, but say, you know, I really have a hard time in my prayer life. It's a struggle for me to pray. You know, the reason why we have a struggle praying is that we don't know God. We don't know him. If we knew who he was, we would be praying more than we are. And the reason we don't know who he is, is that we're not in the word of God where the spirit of God is revealing Jesus Christ to us. That's what these two men are saying. That he's explaining the scripture to us, and as he explains the scripture, he's revealing himself. That's why, listen. It comes full circle. We, the reason why we need to be in the Word of God is so that we can know who He is and more specifically know who Christ is. And as we know who Christ is, it's going to motivate us to pray because we understand who He is. You know, if I, I, you know, we've said this so many times. If I love somebody, I'm going to spend time with them. I want to get to know them. Because the more that I'm with them, the more that I want to be with them. And the more that I'm with them, the more that I want to be with them. It's the same way with Christ. If you want your prayer life to increase, it's by getting into the Word of God and letting the Holy Spirit reveal who Jesus is. If you want to know the step that you need to take, the next step that you need to take, I don't care what that step is. I don't care what the decision is. I don't care what the problem is. If you want to have confidence that the next step I'm taking is what God wants me to do, you need to be in the Word of God. Because that's where God is going to reveal Himself to you in a way that you'll be able to say, I believe that this is what He wants me to do because I know who He is. And I have confidence. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in everything else. Let, let's believe Him for the next step in our journey of faith. For some of you, the Holy Spirit has, is saying to you right now, you need to give your heart to Christ. This is the time, this is the place. You've been on this journey, and just by reading some of these scriptures from the Old Testament, maybe there's something that has said, it's there. I believe it. I, I, I understand it now. And today is the day that you make a commitment to follow Christ as your Lord and Savior. To have your sin forgiven. That just doesn't mean that I pray a prayer. It means that I'm turning from my sin. I'm turning to Christ. It's the act of repentance. And through that act of repentance, God restores your life. Empowers you to live a life that will indeed glorify Him. It will bring fulfillment. I tell you, I love hearing those testimonies, Mark, of those uh, in China. Of what's happened to their lives when they have been exposed to the Word of God and God has revealed Himself to them. Mark can't speak that language. How, how are they able to understand? 
the, the, the Spirit of God has revealed Himself to them through the Word of God. And their lives have been radically changed. Yours can too today. There might be others of you who know the Lord, but there's a, there's a, there's a place in your life you don't have confidence of, of what God is trying to do in your life, of the step that He's wanting you to take. And today is the point of just surrendering that part of your life to Him. There are others God is leading to become part of our church family where we're committed to teaching the Word of God in a way that you can understand it, begin to have others encourage you and, and support you in living that, that Word in your life and being able to share that Word here and around the world. We want to invite you to be a part of that. There are others who might just need to come and pray or talk with somebody about what I've shared today or something totally unrelated. But don't miss this moment that God is speaking to your heart. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that it is true. Lord, it, it, it's, 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 it's been given to us by you. It's God-breathed. And it's not just telling us a story. It's transforming our lives. And so, Lord, we believe. We believe you. And we believe that you want to do a great work in our lives. That you want us to join your eternal plan of making yourself known. And Father, I pray you'll help those today who are here that, that need to take that, that first step of committing their life to you. Of experiencing your grace and mercy in their lives. And out of gratitude and living a life that glorifies you. There might be others who need to become part of our church family, others who need to come and pray to talk with somebody. Father, as you move in our, our hearts, help us to take that step of faith and obedience you're leading us to make right now. In Jesus' name, amen.